today it is my honor to host Rafael Medov. Rafael is a founding director of David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies and co-editor of the Institute's online Encyclopedia of America's response to the Holocaust. He has taught history at Ohio University, Ohio State University, State University of New York at Purchase and elsewhere. He has written 19 books about American Jewish history, Holocaust and related topics, including Too Little and Almost Too Late, the War Refugee Board, and America's response to the Holocaust. Based on recently discovered documents, his new book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, reassesses the hows and whys behind the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration's fateful policies during the Holocaust. With FDR's consent, the administration deliberately prevented European Jews from reaching the refuge in this country. The immigration was kept far below the limits set by U.S. law, which were already set to their historic laws by that time. America, led by Roosevelt's administration, in tandem with Canada and Cuba, refused the request of refuge by Jewish pass passengers of M.S. Lewis, which reached the uh, German ship, uh, which uh, reached the coast of Miami in June 1939. That is, despite the governor of U.S. Virgin Islands declared his willingness to accept them. It also dismissed proposals to use empty liberty ships returning from Europe to carry refugees despite the need of those ships for the ballast during their journey. It rejected pleas to drop bombs on the railways during the uh, leading to Auschwitz, even uh, though American planes were bombing targets only a few miles away action that would not have been in conflict with the larger goal of winning the war and in fact would have been a substantial assistance to the ally of that time, the Soviet Union, in its fight against Nazi Germany. Neither Roosevelt's administration asked England to allow the Jewish refugees to enter the mandate Palestine. However, it is not only the interest in what caused the horrific American policy with regard to Jews during the war at that time that made me invite Raphael to talk about his book. His book deals with the subject what we must talk today as well, and that is the subject of the nature of the Jewish leadership and the dynamics of its relationship with various levels of U.S. government. Before I start asking questions, I have to say that Raphael Medovs authored an excellent book. Here it is. It seems that it is not only my assessment, but also the feeling of other people who have read it. The book has currently five-star rating on Amazon, and judging by numbers I see there, it is selling very, very well. And I advise anybody who is interested in a topic to go and purchase it. Congratulations, Raphael. You have done a great job with this book, and now I'd like to ask you a few questions about it. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show, and go ahead, fire away. You are, as I said, the author of now 19 books with a demonstrated interest in the Holocaust and related topics. What made you select as a topic of this book the relationship of Rabbi Weiss and President Roosevelt regarding the Jews in Europe during World War II? Well, the subject of how America responded to the Holocaust is something that has been at the centerpiece of my, my research and my professional work um, for several decades now. Of course, my work was preceded by um, giants in the field, such as David Wyman, Monty Penkauer, Henry Feingold. They were the ones who wrote the pioneering books in the 1970s and early 1980s about how President Roosevelt responded to the Holocaust. What's unique about this new book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, is that I explore Roosevelt's response, the American government's response, 
but from a very different angle, through the prism of the relationship between the foremost American Jewish leader and the President of the United States. This was a unique relationship. No other uh, leader of an American Jewish organization had the kind of access to President Roosevelt that Rabbi Wise did. But as the book explores and concludes, access does not always uh, equal influence. And in Rabbi Wise's case, although he did um, have the opportunity to meet with President Roosevelt in the White House on a, a number of occasions during the 1930s and 1940s, he almost never was able to succeed in persuading the president to take a serious interest in the concerns that Rabbi Wise raised about the plight of Jews in Europe and about um, British policy in Palestine. Your book, uh, you state that Roosevelt uh, was a master manipulator and Wise fell for his charms. Please elaborate. This is something which, um, which I think is obvious to any uh, careful student of the Wise-Roosevelt relationship. But it's also interesting to note that that is the same conclusion which many of Wise's closest friends and colleagues reached. In the book, I cite uh, post-war interviews, previously unpublished, with a number of Wise's um, uh, fellow, uh, fellow leaders of the American Jewish Congress and the American Zionist Movement and the World Jewish Congress, in which they were reflecting back on Wise and Roosevelt in that era. Wise, by the way, passed away in 1949. So these were interviews done in the 1960s and 1970s um, by various historians. And in the interviews, these um, colleagues of Wise, people like Nahum Goldman from the World Jewish Congress, Emmanuel Newman from the American Zionist Movement, Israel Goldstein, leader of the Synagogue Council of America, all of whom knew Wise very well and worked closely with him, um, they all refer to this phenomenon of how Wise was so profoundly flattered um, and pleased to be able to meet with the president. Um, they mentioned how the president would call him by his first name, which of course was, um, was very uh, satisfying to Wise. Um, Roosevelt on one occasion used a sentence of Wise's in one of his inaugural addresses. So Roosevelt knew how to flatter people in general, and he knew how to flatter Wise. It seemed he sensed that that was a weakness of Wise's, that it was so thrilling to be in the company of the president and to be to have the president act as if Wise was almost his personal friend, that it kind of disarmed Wise. It made it, 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 made it harder for the rabbi to, uh, to forcefully press issues of Jewish concern because, when, because the way the relationship developed was that Wise came to feel like if he were to press too hard on Jewish issues, then he might threaten his friendship what he thought was his friendship with the president of the United States. So gradually, Wise became more and more protective of the president. And when I say protective, what I mean is, in the book, I cite a number of instances in which Wise had a private meeting with Roosevelt, and he raised an issue of some urgency, such as the mass killing of the Jews in Europe, or um, the British shutting down Jewish immigration to Palestine. Um, and in each of these meetings, Wise would raise his concerns, and Roosevelt was always very noncommittal. We know this from Wise's private memos after the meetings um, in which he wrote down what happened. But in public, Wise would never criticize the president or even give the impression that the president was um, noncommittal, which he was. Instead, Wise again and again would tell reporters or tell um, others in the Jewish community that in fact, that Roosevelt was looking out for the Jewish people's best interests, that Roosevelt was, was promising to take um, concrete action to help the Jews, um, when in fact, Roosevelt had never promised any such thing to Wise, and what Wise was really doing, we might call it running interference for the president in the Jewish community. In other words, Wise, Wise set himself up as the president's shield from Jewish criticism. He would tell the Jewish community and fellow Jewish leaders that Roosevelt was doing all he could to, let's say, to help Jewish refugees, when in fact he wasn't. And what that did is it, it undermined the possibility of 
others in the Jewish community openly challenging the president's refugee policies or other policies that were related to, to the ongoing Holocaust. Very interesting. Uh, is this liking of flattery, or as you call it, weakness, unique to wise, or it's common among Jewish leaders throughout our history? Well, I certainly have seen it um, on other occasions involving other public figures and other Jewish leaders. So I wouldn't say it was unique to Wise. I, I, what I would say is that the significance of, of the case of Wise is that this was the most um, urgent moment in modern Jewish times. This was a slaughter of Jews on an unprecedented scale. So the emergency was so acute that um, for Wise to, to, um, to suppress his criticism of the president, because he was enjoying the, the friendship and the flattery and the access, um, it had ramifications. I guess that's the point. It had serious ramifications. In calmer times, you know, for a Jewish leader to, um, to be taken in by a president maybe wasn't so consequential. Maybe the ramifications would not be so serious. But for this have had to have happened at a time when, you know, when, when Jews were being slaughtered in Europe every day, makes it a much more serious matter. I, Jewish leaders to this day are not immune from this problem. Um, and I think we all know of examples where contemporary Jewish organizational leaders seem to have let themselves be kind of taken in by the excitement of being um, in the company of a president or, uh, or a king or, or, other, um, or other public figures. So it's not, it's not that wise is the only one to suffer from this um, unfortunate tendency. Um, but in Wise case, Wise's case, it was particularly important because the result of, of Wise being taken in was that it, was, it took longer and it was harder for other, others in the Jewish community to rally and, and begin to press the Roosevelt administration to do something to rescue Jews, which normally would have been Rabbi Wise's job. But, uh, but what happened ultimately is that other groups kind of stepped into the vacuum that was created by Wise's inaction. And uh, Rabbi Wise was at that time uh, the number one, the most important and the leading uh, Jewish leader or the most visible Jewish leader in the United States, right? He was the head of... Um, five different major Jewish organizations and institutions simultaneously. The American Jewish Congress, the World Jewish Congress, the American Zionist Movement, he was the head of his own rabbinical seminary, um, and a synagogue in Manhattan. So he really had his plate full. Now, um, today you don't have that phenomenon. You don't have Jewish leaders who try to run more than one organization at a time. And, and, to, and to make it even more um, unfortunate, Wise's case, he was not in good health. During the period that we're talking about, the 1940s, um, he turned 70 at a time when the average uh, life expectancy for the American male um, was less than that. He had multiple illnesses. He, in, in many cases, as I show in the book, he had to miss important meetings with political leaders or important Jewish gatherings uh, because he was, um, he was sick. So he really wasn't, he wasn't equipped to do, to undertake the task which history had placed in his lap. Now, I think the responsible thing for him to have done, and this is not just me saying it in hindsight, but others said it at the time, the responsible thing, because he was so busy and so unwell, um, would have been to turn over at least some of the responsibility and the power to younger, more activist-minded, more vigorous Jewish or Zionist leaders. And there were many on the scene who could have um, helped uh, sh shoulder some of that burden and, and could have been more effective than wise, especially because they were not so beholden to President Roosevelt. The most prominent example is Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver of Cleveland, who at one point during this period was briefly the co-chairman of the American Zionist movement with wise. 
Um, but uh, that didn't last long. They're, they're clashing egos and, um, and clashing political views ultimately made it impossible for the two of them to work together, which is another tragic feature of the history of this period, the specter of Jewish leaders who just can't get along uh, for personal and for political reasons. But in the case of Wise, um, he, he, knew, he knew that his abilities were limited, yet he could not bring himself to compromise and invite other people into, um, into the, senior, um, the senior hierarchy of the Jewish organizational world. And so as a result, he held tight to the, to, the, to the reins of power. He kept it tightly in his grip, and that too um, weakened the response of the American Jewish community to the crisis in Europe. Um, the name of your book is The Jews Should Keep Quiet. What Roosevelt wanted Jews to be quiet about? Well, the title of the book is a very close paraphrase of something that Roosevelt said to Wise on multiple occasions, um, and which he pressed Wise to in turn say to other Jews who were thinking of protesting. And the, the essential message was, from Roosevelt to Wise, don't publicly challenge U.S. refugee policy, U.S. immigration policy, don't say anything critical of the Roosevelt administration. Go along with our policies, um, and the, when when you know when we defeat the Nazis, then the Jews will be saved. And that that idea uh, that Jews can the Jews can only be saved or rescued um, through a victory over the Nazis that was a common refrain of President Roosevelt and his administration during this entire period. When wise or other Jewish leaders would ask him to take steps to rescue Jews. They would say rescue is only possible through victory. The reality, of course, was that, and I'm sure we'll talk about it soon, there were many opportunities to rescue Jews that did not interfere with victory, with the, with the war effort. But um, this idea that the Jews should keep quiet was something which Wise basically accepted. And uh, I show many instances in the book where Wise um, persuaded his colleagues in the various Jewish organizations that he headed, he persuaded them to refrain from publicly challenging President Roosevelt's policies. Um, and in turn, Wise also pressured um, other, others in the Jewish community to keep quiet, to temper their criticism, not to embarrass the president, not to embarrass the Democratic Party, not to make waves, and uh, also, in Wise's view, not to do anything that might provoke anti-Semitism. This is also a common refrain in Wise's private correspondence that he was afraid that Jewish protests against the president's policies might cause more anti-Semitism in the United States. It's very interesting. <clears throat> I mean, right now, uh, I think it was what Stott Sterkel wrote, uh, The Good War. Yes. Uh, and it seems like now when Americans remember uh, the Second World War and fight against Nazis, they remember, first of all, uh, Eisenhower walked through concentration camp and uh, uh, supposedly America's saving of Jews. Well, um, Eisenhower did personally view um, a concentration camp after the war, um, after the Roosevelt administration had declined to take any action to save those Jews. So um, while it was very important that Eisenhower did that, um, not all of those Jews had to have died. We don't know how many Jews would have been saved uh, had the Roosevelt administration taken rescue steps. We can, only say, we can only say some would have been saved because there were, there were many things that the administration could have done that Jewish leaders proposed at the time. This is not just me saying, in hindsight, they should have done X, Y, and Z. In the book, I explore the rescue opportunities that were proposed at the time by Wise and by others. Now, the difference between Wise proposing it and others proposing it was this. When Wise would propose some rescue action, like allowing more Jews to come temporarily to America or allowing them to go to Palestine, and Roosevelt would say no, Wise took no for an answer. 
And that would be the end of it with wives. Other Jewish groups, and now I'm referring specifically to the activists known as the Bergson Group, um, they didn't take no for an answer. What they did when they saw the administration refusing to act um, to help Jew Jewish refugees is they began uh, organizing public protests. They placed um, full page ads in major American newspapers calling on the administration to rescue Jews. They organized a, a, a march by more than 400 rabbis to the White House in 1943. They lobbied in Congress and uh, uh, was especially important, in their lobbying on Capitol Hill, they built relationships with Republicans as well as Democrats. Now I raise this point because Rabbi Wise um, was friendly with a number of uh, Democrats in Congress, but he had almost no relationships on the other side of the aisle. The essence of um, what we today call coalition politics is that you have to have, um, you have to find allies, you have to make friends in both parties. And that if you only have um, allies on one side, then it becomes much harder to have an impact. Wise um, only built relationships with members of Congress with whom he agreed on other issues, on domestic issues, congressmen with whom he felt comfortable um, on various social and political issues. He was not, he, 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 he naturally um, was not comfortable with Republicans whom he associated with isolationism, nativism, and so forth. What the Bergson Group did that was unique and important is they built relationships with powerful Republicans like former President Herbert Hoover, and uh, Senator Robert Taft from Ohio, and Claire Booth Luce, the Congresswoman from Connecticut, who was a rising star in the party, and other um, Republicans. And that helped put pressure on President Roosevelt because for the first time, he had to consider the possibility that if he didn't do something for the Jews, that the Republicans might start attracting Jewish voters away from him. Now, whether or not there was really any chance of the Republicans attracting Jewish votes the 1940s is certainly debatable, but that's not the point. The point is the, the, the fact that there was even such a threat created a kind of a new political dynamic. For the first time, Roosevelt could not assume, now I'm speaking about 1943, 1944, he could no longer assume that the Jewish vote was in his pocket. That was one of the most important accomplishments of what the Bergson Group did. To have 400 rabbis march through the streets of Washington, and up to the gates of the White House, and then have the president turn them away and refuse to meet with him, that was an extraordinary um, development in American Jewish history. First of all, because uh, no American Jewish organization had ever staged a protest march in Washington. I know today we're very accustomed to Jews marching to the White House, but this was completely a new political tactic in 1943. Um, and the fact that after this march, a number of the leaders of, of the protesters criticized the president to the news media was something that was almost unheard of. The idea of Jews criticizing President Roosevelt for turning away from the plight of the Jewish refugees was something completely new. Um, and it created the prospect that there could be political consequences for the administration if Roosevelt continued with this policy of abandoning the Jews. Well, uh, I see that what you just said makes a lot of sense. However, how then do you explain that the quota for immigrants, for refugees from Germany, which was, like you say, not filled, you know, throughout almost entire period of Roosevelt administration, was fully filled in 1939 and 1940 when it seems like Roosevelt needed Jewish votes. So let's begin, first of all, with what the quota represented. Um, the quota from Germany we're talking about now right. was um, approximately 27,000 during the period from 1933 to 1945. And as you note, it was almost never filled. In the tw those 12 years, it was filled only once, 1939. Um, and in most of those years, it was not even one-fourth filled, meaning it was 75% unfilled or more in most of those years. Altogether, there were nearly 200,000 
unused quota places from Germany and later from German occupied territories. So those are, those are quota places which could have been allotted to Jewish refugees within the existing law. I emphasize this because often in our discussions about, about FDR's response to the Holocaust, um, those who defend his position will say that, well, you had t tight immigration quotas, so he couldn't have brought more Jews over. But in fact, even within those existing quotas, even if the quotas were not changed, if the existing immigration system stayed in place, there were still nearly 200,000 Jews who could have come. The general approach of the Roosevelt administration during this entire period regarding Jewish immigration was to suppress the number of, um, of immigrants allowed, the number of refugees allowed to come to the US. And they did this um, by piling on all sorts of extra requirements and bureaucratic obstacles, which made it difficult for refugees to qualify for visas. Meaning when a Jew in uh, Berlin went to the US, uh, nearest US consulate and applied for a visa to the US, even though there were spaces available in the quota, the, consul, the consulate officials made it so difficult that, um, that only a, a very small number actually qualified for the visas. The reason the quota was filled in 1939 was this. Um, in 1938, when the, the Germans invaded and annexed, absorbed Austria in the Anschluss, the Jewish refugee crisis, as it was becoming known, suddenly reached um, unprecedented proportions. An enormous number of Austrian Jews wanted to emigrate, in addition to all the German Jews who were seeking to leave. So you suddenly had a very large body of, of people wanting to leave. And um, in the United States, if you look at the press coverage of the Anschluss, you see that there was a very widespread publicity uh, for the, um, the, the horrors that the Germans inflicted on Austrian Jews when, the, when they marched in to Austria. The, the infamous photographs of Jews being forced to scrub the streets with toothbrushes appeared in American newspapers. Um, and the, in, the incredible lines outside the American consulate um, in Vienna waiting for visas was something that was very well known. As a result, there was a, a groundswell of pressure in the spring of 1938 from some members of Congress, from some journalists and others for the United States to do something. And that was why um, the Roosevelt administration came up with the idea of holding an international conference on the refugee problem, which took place um, in, uh, in, in the summer of 1938 in the town of Evian, France. 32 countries sent representatives. Now, unfortunately, none of the countries represented there were willing to take in any large, uh, any noticeable number of refugees with the exception of the Dominican Republic, which I'll comment on in a moment. In, in, that, in those circumstances, the United States, having organized this conference, um, could not continue to, um, to suppress immigration below the existing quota. The United States had to be able to say that they were allowing immigrants in according to the existing law, but at the same time, the American delegates emphasized that they would not be uh, taking in any more than that. And that's basically, the, that was the tone of the conference. All of the other countries essentially said the same thing. After the Kristallnacht pogrom later that year in November, the nationwide uh, Nazi German uh, violence in which uh, thousands of synagogues were burned down, tens of thousands of windows in Jewish homes and businesses and, and, and institutions were smashed, nearly 100 Jews murdered, tens of thousands hauled away to concentration camps. In the wake of that horrific violence, which was a headline news around the world, um, President Roosevelt uh, allowed the, the quota from Germany to continue to be filled, but just during that brief period of late 1938 into late 1939. After that, um, again, from 1940 onward, the quota was not filled. And, uh, and the number of visas continued to go down each year. So there was that one brief period. Um, but that was also the period when the tragic voyage of the refugee ship St. Louis took place in the spring of 1939. 
when the St. Louis sought, as you noted, admission to Canada, Cuba, and the United States. At that point, the German quota for the, the United States immigration quota from Germany was full during that brief time. So it would not have been possible for the president to simply allow those passengers to disembark. But that doesn't mean he couldn't do anything. On the contrary, the, um, the governor of the Virgin Islands, a U.S. territory, uh, publicly offered to take the Jews in, um, as did the Legislative Assembly of the Virgin Islands. So the whole administration of that American territory publicly offered to take them in. Um, and it wasn't just uh, something which was mentioned in theory, but rather um, while the ship was hovering off the coast of Florida and the passengers were pleading in telegrams to the White House for, you know, for a haven, the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr., um, raised this specific issue of the Virgin Islands with Secretary of State Cordell Hull and President Roosevelt. We have the transcripts of the conversations between Morgenthau and Hull, in which Morgenthau said, why don't we just let these, 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 for these poor refugees go temporarily to the Virgin Islands? And Hull told him, well, I've discussed this with the president, and um, we can't allow them uh, to go to the Virgin Islands because they would need tourist visas or visitor's visas. In order to qualify for a visitor's visa, you had to have a safe permanent address, a permanent address to which you would return when your six-month tourist visa expired. So Hull said to Morgenthau, uh, well, these people don't have a permanent address to which they return, or they're fleeing from Nazi Germany, so we can't trust that they'll go back after six months. Now, you see this terrible catch-22. What Hull was saying is they don't have a safe place to go back to, so therefore, we're not going to admit them, and we're going to send them back to that very unsafe place. And in fact, when the St. Louis began its long journey back across the Atlantic, back to Europe, um, as far as President Roosevelt and his administration knew, they were going back to Germany, the land of Kristallnacht, of violence, of, of smashed windows and, 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 and Jews who were murdered. As it happens, uh, Jewish uh, uh, organizations, mainly the Joint Distribution Committee, were able to negotiate with several European governments to take in those refugees. So when the ship returned to Europe, it did not have to return to Germany. Um, a portion of the passengers were each taken in by England, France, Holland, and Belgium. The ones who went to England, as it turned out, were the luckiest, since England was never invaded by the Germans. Um, those St. Louis passengers who disembarked in England were all saved. The ones who went to Holland and Belgium and France, however, were not safe for very long because the following year, the Germans, of course, overran those, those countries um, and, um, and many of the Jews who had um, tried to come to America or turned away um, ended up being murdered in the Holocaust. Uh, how do you explain the reason that uh, American Jewish leaders uh, often so reluctant, so, so not reluctant to speak on behalf of somebody else who experiences great difficulties or problems, and so reluctant to speak on behalf of the Jews. I mean, like for example, New York Times publisher, former publisher, Arthur Sulzberger. Uh, he was a reformed Jew, and which and stayed with classic definition that Jews are not really people but faith, and he did not care. Jews had problems, you know. Uh, they had the refugee problem like anybody else, not necessarily like Jews, and that was the publisher of the nation's most influential newspaper, uh, who allowed only few uh, editorials and articles, at least until 1943, about this problem. When we speak of the American Jewish community's response, and now we're not talking about the, the leadership like Rabbi Wise, but the Jewish community as a whole, including people like the Salzburgers, let's first keep in mind that the majority of American Jews in those days were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. For many, um, America 
and it's um, a America was not a given. In other words, they were new citizens and they were not yet entirely comfortable with their place in American society. They did not feel comfortable and secure the way American Jews do today, for example. But rather, um, for them, it was not a given that they would be treated equally and fairly. Now, not all of Ameri American Jews reacted the way the Sulzbergers did. Um, I think they carried this attitude of nervousness to an extreme. Um, but, but in general, we, we, we should keep in mind that um, it was a period of, of widespread anti-Semitism in the United States. And when you combine that with the reality that many American Jews felt uneasy and uncertain about their place in American society, it's not surprising that for some, there was what you call um, a reluctance to speak out. Uh, on the other hand, however, there were many American Jews who did speak out. This is one of the more fascinating aspects of the American Jewish response, which I explore um, in the book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet. There were many Jews who refused to keep quiet. Some of them, like the Bergson Group, um, acted through taking out newspaper ads or lobbying in Washington. There were many others who, um, who spoke out in different ways. There were students at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York City, rabbinical students who started their own activist group and tried to raise the Jewish community's awareness of what was happening. There were these rabbis, more than 400 of them, who marched through the streets of Washington just three days before Yom Kippur, uh, when rabbis are, of course, normally very, very busy preparing for that holiest day on the Jewish calendar, they left their synagogues and they left their yeshivas and made the not so easy trip down to Washington to march to the gates of the White House and plead for their brethren. Um, and there were others. There were um, certain Jewish journalists who, who spoke out courageously and, um, and criticized the Roosevelt administration for not taking a greater action. You mentioned uh, earlier in your introduction the phenomenon of the empty American ships returning with ballast uh, to weigh them down. Well, I'd like to return to that for a moment because there were several um, um, segments of the American Jewish community, several sources like the Bergson Group, um, newspapers like the Baltimore Jewish Times, which specifically raised this issue of the empty ships. Now, we're speaking here of ships that were known as Liberty ships, and they brought um, weapons and later troops to England during the war. These, trips returned, these ships returned empty to the United States. In order to prevent them from capsizing because they were so light, they had it to be loaded down with ballast, that is with rubble, um, chunks of concrete, which were typically taken from cities in England, like Bristol, which had suffered very greatly from the German Blitz. So the ships were, were, came, returned to America filled with chunks of, of, of rubble. Um, and that's why the Bergson Group and the Baltimore Jewish Times and others um, publicly proposed that if you're weighing the ships down with chunks of, of concrete, why not weigh them down with Jewish refugees? This was an important argument because on many occasions when Jewish organizations or leaders, including Rabbi Wise, raised this issue about bringing Jewish refugees temporarily to the United States during the war, they would be told by Roosevelt administration officials that there's no shipping available. We need all of the ships for the war effort. Um, and this, for Rabbi Wise, this posed a kind of a dilemma or a conflict. He was, he, was, he was essentially being told that if he was asking for ships to bring refugees, he would be undermining the war effort. He would be unpatriotic. He would be saying, don't use the ships to help fight uh, the war, use the ships for, for my fellow uh, Jews. In fact, that's not what Jewish groups were asking for. They were asking for the use of these empty ships. This is, an, this is one of, of, of a number of important examples of opportunities for rescue that the Roosevelt administration deliberately um, ignored or, or, or even sabotaged in some cases. The administration knew that the ships were available um, and there were plenty of places you could put Jewish refugees temporarily but the administration's overall policy was not to bring more Jews into America. And therefore, even, even a policy like this, using the Liberty ships, which would not have, 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 have been much of a, a trouble or expense, um, 
nonetheless, that was unacceptable to the president and to his administration. Hmm. Um, I want to get back to the issue of uh, leadership uh, of our people in this country, because to me, this is an important issue, especially uh, in the view of rising anti-Semitism in this nation. I mean, uh, just came out report that uh, this is the highest recorded number of last year of anti-Semitic incidents uh, since beginning of counting or the last 40 years or something like this. And uh, there's no, it seems like there's no end to it. Maybe this just seems to me that way. But in any case, today we do not have uh, a towering figure representing American Jews like was Rabbi Weiss at that time. So now we have different rabbis, mostly rabbis, uh, speaking up, maybe not speaking up, and uh, not always uh, in the interest of Jews, the way I see it. Now, but getting back, before we'll get to this point, I'd like to get back to Rabbi Weiss and his relationship not only with President Roosevelt, but also with President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson. Now, Weiss uh, was very active, politically active, in 1912 campaign and 1916. Between those two years, there was 1914, in 1915, the years of massive slaughter of Russian Jews by Tsarist Russian army. When Russia declared the war back on Germany in 1914, August 1st, it also declared war on its own Jews. Now, the Jews in New York knew about it. Yiddish press was full of stories about it. A number of individuals in the United States, including, including the closest friends of Woodrow Wilson, did everything in their power to prevent the news of the massacres reaching English press in the United States. Weiss knew all about it. Did he say anything about it? Well, you've put your finger on a very interesting and important area for future research. I'm not aware that there has been any serious scholarship on this specific question of how American Jews responded to those pogroms during the World War I period and, and, and shortly after World War I. Um, so this is something which scholars should be taking a look at, and I'll, and I'll add, this segues into uh, an important related question. And that is, why is it that American Jewish leaders, including Rabbi Wise, said virtually nothing about the persecution of Jews in the Soviet Union during the 1920s and 1930s. Now, some would probably say, well, they may not have had extensive knowledge of what was going on there. I don't think that's an adequate answer. Um, it's true that in today's world, we know a lot more about human rights violations around the world than people did then, but it doesn't mean it wasn't known then. Um, and, I, and, and there probably are other important reasons why they didn't. But the whole question of American Jews um, and, and the plight of Jews in the Soviet Union is something that has not been extensively studied. And I'm talking here about the pre-war period. Several books have been written in recent years about the Soviet Jewry protest movement in America during the 1960s and 1970s. But the period you're talking about, which is the teens, and then I'm talking about the 20s and the 30s, um, as you know, there were severe pogroms, mass slaughter, of Jews um, in the Ukraine and then in the Soviet, in, in the Soviet Union, severe persecution once, um, and once the communists took over. And it's something which American Jews do not seem to have taken a serious interest in. Now, you mentioned that there was widespread reporting in the Yiddish press, and that's important um, because the immigrants, the you know, average American Jews, undoubtedly were keenly interested in what was happening. And yet we do not find the established leadership making a major issue of it. So I, I'm looking forward to, I hope that scholars um, 
of that period will will begin to take a serious interest in the subject because it's it's important. Now, when you speak of of the early world early World War One period, Wise, uh, of course, was not yet at the peak of his power as a Jewish leader. That was, if you're talking about 1912, 1914, that's before there was an American Jewish Congress or a World Jewish Congress. The American Zionist movement was still um, in its earliest stages. Nonetheless, nonetheless, as you note, Wise had relationships with Wilson and with other important American political figures. And Wise aside, there are other leaders of, of established Jewish organizations who might have been in a position um, to speak out of course, the question has to be um, analyzed, what could the American government have done um, in those instances? But I, I think this is something historians have um, neglected until now, and it's, it's something I, I hope that they will take a serious look at. Mm. You know, at that particular time, uh, just the declaration, the statement from the American government about it would have caused Russia to stop, to actively stop, because there was a lot of people in Russia, in civilian segment of Russian society, that were aware of it and tried to do something about it. They couldn't. But that is not what I want to talk about it now. I want to talk about the, uh, I want to ask about the nature, because your book triggered in me this question. Do American Jews today you have leaders that can stand up for our interests. Well, not Jews in Europe, not in Germany, not in Poland, but Jews in America will be sold out as well. One of the problems that I explore um, in The Jews Should Keep Quiet is the lack of democracy in the American Jewish community in those days. It's a problem which I think is just as serious today. And what I mean by that is Rabbi Wise, for example, was not democratically elected. He was not chosen in an election to be the head of the World Jewish Congress or the American Zionist movement. People rose to power in those days like they do today by virtue of their, um, their political connections or their donations or other, other, other means, but not because of the power of the ballot. There have been, um, very, very few democratic elections in the American, in the entire history of the American Jewish community. So the problem in the time of Wise was that those who were dissatisfied with Wise's response in the 1930s or 1940s didn't have an opportunity to vote him out of power. It wasn't as if um, even members of the American Jewish Congress or, or the World Jewish Congress could have you know, elected a different leader. So, um, so that what that yeah, did is we, that do, do we have this situation now that people can yeah. elect, for example, in JUF any uh, 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 any leader, or you go at that meeting and they shut you up right there because they already know who they're going to be uh, voting for. Well, as you know all too well, the very long time head of the Jewish Federation finally retired, um, and they simply handed the presidency to his son. So. That kind of um, phenomenon where leadership is just passed from father to son or friend to friend or donor to donor, instead of actually allowing the community to choose its leaders, that's a phenomenon which um, is, is just as much, as much a problem today. Now, um, so today you have um, dozens of Jewish organizations. They're all represented. The major ones are all represented in the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. Um, all of those organizations within the Conference of Presidents um, have leaders who are not democratically elected. They all have um, a people who are selected by a, a handful of the donors or board members. And the Conference of Presidents itself, when it chooses a leader, it, they have an elect, what they call an election, but there's always one candidate. So this lack of democracy in the 40s and today creates the same problem, where the community is not able to express its wishes or determine the policies it wants. And people can only sort of hope that those who claim to speak in their name will actually do the things that they would have wanted to do. Now, of course, the great irony here is that as Americans, American Jews, of course, cherish and champion the concept of democracy. Nobody would, would, could, could conceive of living in an America where we didn't have the democratic right to choose our leaders. And yet within the Jewish community, for some reason, 
the value of democracy is not taken seriously at all. This, I, I would uh, say, is a, a major problem, and it hampers um, the political effectiveness of the Jewish community. But most of all, it's simply unfair. People simply don't have the right to choose their leaders, and they didn't then. And, and we see what, among the consequences of the lack of democracy then was that somebody like Rabbi Wise and others, but Wise is our focus, he could perpetuate his power almost endlessly, and nobody could do anything about it. Um, the issue of America, America's failure to provide refuge to Jews of Europe during the Second World War, uh, has turned, in my mind, America, Golden Medina, into a very, very tarnished Golden Medina. And I would like to read a passage from your book where you cite Nation's editor, Freda Kirchway, writing, in this country, you and I, the President and the Congress, and the State Department, are accessories to the crime and share Hitler's guilt. If we had behaved like humane and generous people instead of complacent, cowardly ones, the two million lying today in Earth of Poland would be alive and safe. Um, I would like to ask you, because your concept of what you just said, democracy within Jewish community, um, is very important. And I'm going to be thinking about it because until you just brought it up, I did not really think in those terms, you know, because people who pay, they order, you know, they buy the, uh, this community and this community, they give the money, so they decide how the money is going to be spent. But the issue is very important because they also get in spaces and get in place where genuine representation of Jews is necessary and they don't provide it. Now, um, there's one person that you quote in your book, and um, his name is Carl Hermann Voss. Uh, he, when he was alive, one, was one of the better known American Christian Zionists. Uh, Zionists. And in uh, encyclopedia.com, he expressed an opinion full of high praise for Rabbi Wise, saying that much of criticism Wise is getting is unfair. Now, it couldn't have been about your book because he died way before the book was published. But uh, what do you make of this uh, 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 quote by Voss? History has not been kind to Weiss, who tried to lead a divided American Jewish community during the most perilous time in Jewish history. He was known in his day as an activist who had been protesting Nazism at its inception and led Stop Hitler Now rallies in 1943 and onward. Yet he is regarded by the younger generation as a symbol of ineffective and timid Jewish leadership just when boldness and brilliance were required. He is regarded as too close to President Roosevelt and reluctant to criticize him for fear of wounding him politically. Some, but not all, of the criticism is unfair. Is he talking about you? I don't know. Carl Hermann Voss was a personal friend of Rabbi Wise's, and I'm, I'm not surprised that he would rise to, um, to the rabbi's defense. But there's something contained in his very remark, which I think is extremely revealing, and actually, um, it actually answers the question he raises. He points out that 
Wise led, as he calls them, Stop Hitler Now rallies in 1943 and at other times. Now, Stop Hitler Now was actually the, that was the slogan, that was the theme of the, rally he's talk, of the rallies he's talking about. There were several of them, there were a number of them. Um, but think about what he's saying. Stop Hitler Now in 1943. Now, in 1943, the United States was obviously deeply in World War II. American GIs were dying every single day to stop Hitler. So to have a rally in which the, the demand is stop Hitler now was almost meaningless. Now, what's the point here? Point is that Wise was afraid. He was reluctant to press Roosevelt for real, concrete, practical steps. It was much easier and more comfortable to say stop Hitler now, which everybody was saying and everybody was doing. Um, it was almost a meaningless slogan. A, in a rally where the, where the slogan had been, I don't, save the Jews, open the doors, or, or some theme involving a practical consequence, I think that might have made a greater impression um, on, on the president and his administration. As long as the president knew that the only thing the Jews were asking is stop Hitler now, well, then obviously he wouldn't feel any pressure to do much more than that. So it's these kind of minimal demands, minimal positions that Wise took, which in fact undercut the possibility of actually bringing about rescue. So while I, I understand Carl Hermann Voss's sentiment here and his personal attachment to Wise, his friend, nonetheless, when you think carefully about what he's saying, well, that's not a very good example um, of Wise doing something that deserves our admiration. On the contrary, I would say the fact that he was um, that Wise was still sticking to these, um, these easy, minimal, comfortable slogans in 1943, it really shows how behind the times Wise was. In 1943, while Wise was saying, stop Hitler now, 400 rabbis were ignoring Wise, marching to the White House, and pleading with the president to create a new government agency to rescue Jews. Now, president, that was the president did not see him, right? That's right, but that was a bold political demand. And, and when the president refused to see them, and they criticized the president publicly in the newspapers, that made a much greater impression on the administration than a Rabbi Wise saying, let's all stop Hitler. Uh, Raphael, excellent response. I really appreciate you saying all, everything that you said. And I'm glad we had a conversation to talk. And I hope, once again, that people that are interested in future of Jews, not only in the history, because history, this is what informs our action today for, for the future, will go and get this book on Amazon or any other place and uh, read it and think about it. Anyway, Rafael, thank you very much for you being our guest. Uh, it was enjoyable, for me at least, conversation. And I hope to talk to you one day again. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. For those of your listeners who are interested in more information about my work, the website of the David Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies is wymaninstitute.org, W-Y-M-A-N, wymaninstitute.org. Thank you very much. You have a great day. Thanks. Take care.